Hello and welcome back to Data News of the Week. That is right, it's the video where we take all the little blibs and blobs of news story that involve data that have happened around the world and squeeze it into a single video. Now last week I didn't do a news video, I'll be honest with you, I got caught up in some new release stuff. Uh, this Data News of the Week is going to be for the last 10 days, close to 2 weeks of stuff. So there's a little bit more than usual to unpack. And our first story is one that's appearing more and more on UK news sites. It is that the NHS suffered a ransomware attack. Now, now, first reports on this go back to the 4th of August. Na uh, the National Health Service here, uh, the pride of the UK, let's be honest, was hit. And um, not the primary target, it looks like, is the 111 service there. That's kind of the non high priority emergency line that's utilised next to 999 here in the UK. And although I would say one of the best stories out there, or one of the earliest stories for the BBC News site, I'm going to get onto an article in The Guardian that goes into a little bit more detail, uh, but the advanced company that manages, uh, they're actually just called Advanced, um, that were uh, kind of managing a lot of the uh, cyber security and network security over for the NHS did originally report this on Thursday the 4th of August and although details are still very thin on the ground there's different reports and quotations coming out of different people that worked in call centers at 111 and a few people that have been in communication with the 111 service talking about how they couldn't access um, doctor's notes and information on their system within the last few days. Now, there's still no precise information quoted by Advanced or the NHS themselves with regards to, you know, the actual uh, impact um, overall of this ransomware uh, strike. And this is where that Guardian article that I talk about um, it kind of goes into a little bit more detail because there is a slight question of whether this is a true ransomware attack. And by that, what I mean is, is this a case of data being removed from the infrastructure or simply a lack of access to that data from within the NHS and um, advanced uh, system there that's going to allow um, basically precipitate a ransom payment to allow access to it. Now, again, the severity of the attack, the attack hasn't completely been identified there. And I think this is something that's going to be rolling out uh, in public um, disclaimers out there in the next few weeks, I would say. It's going to be very hard to keep a lid on something like this when you think of the scale of the NHS. But again, the true depth of this and just how much of uh, this information has been impacted, whether it's just current information and not archival, and whether that information is up to the second synchronized and backed up, is something we'll learn about soon. But do stay tuned for this and keep an eye on this story, because I think this is something that's going to roll out quite quickly. And this isn't the first instance we've seen in the last few months of a public service um, or, you know, .orgs being attacked by ransomware when they are coming from organizations where the payment towards ransomware isn't quite as straightforward when trying to facilitate and get those keys back. And I would certainly not endorse ever chasing ransomers to get that key. Next up, this is following up something I talked about a few weeks ago on Data News of the Week with regards to hardware, uh, hard drive brands highlighting uh, that their numbers, uh, sales numbers, profit numbers, unit number sales aren't quite as good as previous quarters. Now, the latest one is, of course, WD previously. We talked about Seagate and how they've been impacted. But WD numbers have arrived and they are down. They're saying in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year 2022, uh, they were down, you know, quite a substantial amount, 11% up year on year from the previous segment. But ultimately, it's a poor final quarter over a good year previous. Now, one of the big reasons for this, as we've highlighted before, there's been so many um, nebulous factors that are incredibly hard to track while you're in the bubble. Um, you know, obviously, the pandemic, everyone's pointing out quite easily in its effects on the supply chain and semiconductor shortages and more. But a lot of people seemingly uh, overlook Chia and its impact last year on the tremendous spike it saw in sales, not only of quantity sales, but also just the sheer price increase that happened across a lot of large capacities due to supp supply and demand and scarcity. Consequently, I think it would be pretty understandable that now that, you know, Chia as a cryptocurrency is, if not dead and buried, hopefully just out of the picture entirely, now we're seeing things return price-wise at least, to a slight sense of normality. And I think a lot of that year on year is where we're going to see a lot of those losses coming down. But it's the idea that there seems to be a, a worser outlook on the horizon as we're going to see that goalpost shift 
move forward into the next at least two quarters there. So again, although I am linking to the WD article here, I strongly recommend checking out the Seagate article over on Blocks and Files from late July, because that does go into a lot more detail about some of those individual impacts that I you know, personally feel they could have maybe added to that file for the WD one there. Next up, returning to Seagate there, we can talk a little bit about their increased partnership with Fizon with the new X1 controller. Now, the X1 controller is not really going to be looking currently at the PCIe Gen 5 generation. They're still putting the focus there on PCIe Gen 4. Once again, because of the shortages, because of the change in patterns, we're seeing PCIe Gen 5 arrive commercially much later than we thought it would. We thought by now... August, September time, we'd see the first initial inklings of PCIe Gen 5 storage media appearing in the consumer sector. It's already kind of out there in the enterprise high tier, at least in testing sectors. But PCIe Gen 4 is still flourishing very, very well. And one of the great examples of this is this new X1 controller. Seagate and Fison have always had a very close relationship in a lot of their products. But with the Nitro series, which is kind of like their fiber channel flash fabric tier, what this X1 controller is bringing to the party is efficiency, power efficiency and low power utilization. And when you are talking about data center, flash, fabric, etc., you are talking about 24-7 intense utilization. And this is where durability really kicks in. And the Nitro series has always been a big one for high uh, drive rights per day uh, rate ratings there between one and three and even higher in some of the cases of the more enterprise level drives and what we're seeing here in the case of this the nitro 5550 on cdr labs where it first broke we can see a lot more information about that high drive right per day being affected to the pci gen 4 tier of enterprise grade ssd because a lot of people seemingly forget that once you move on to the higher tiers of performance particularly uh, gen 3 versus gen 4 that higher performance threshold means that the drive rights per day if you keep the same figures as you had as always whilst increasing the performance level on those drives they're just not going to last as long so being able to maintain that standard in spite of the higher performance threshold there over the five years is still a tremendous accomplishment and i think a big part of that is that partnership there with the new Fazon x1 and Seagate's new generation of Nitro. And where we see it moving forward after this, as we move into the PCIe Gen 5 um, generation, and we see things like the Fizon E26 controller, as well as improved controllers at the um, uh, uh, PCIe Gen 4 level there with Fizon, with upgrades on the E18 we've seen before, it's going to be really interesting to see how this relationship continues between the two companies and whether we're going to see a little bit more exclusivity on some of these components with Fizon towards Seagate and not being shared out as we saw with the E18 and E16 controller till now. Carrying on with the subject of SSDs, let's move the focus over to Samsung. It's been a real SSD heavy news of the week, right? Um, Samsung revealed some of their newer generation flash and SSD solutions and on their newsroom they released multiple different little news reports there showing off different bits and bobs that they've got in mind for the PCIe Gen 5 and Gen 4 generation it has to be said but the one that was really standing out and again I'm linking to another Blocks and Files article they've been really heavy this week on News of the Week is their petabyte scale SSD now bear in mind this is not an SSD with a petabyte of storage petabyte scale means that we are now at the point where utilizing um, only a handful of drives together can raid up to the petabyte level of storage, the 1PB. Now, this is the most interesting thing that I could see on there. Although, again, check out the article for lots of other innovations on both memory and distribution of NAND across these drives. But this is the really interesting one because, on the one hand, we are looking at a drive that utilizes QLC, and we always knew the earliest generation of the highest capacities on SSD was always going to use um, the, the four bit layer cells uh, on SSD NAND. But what's really intriguing on this 128 TB standalone drive there is it's actually two. PCBs inside. It's linked with a ribbon cable in the middle with a distribution of individual controllers and NAND. It's effectively two big SSDs in one working in parity. And it's not working as a RAID drive, but it is the idea that with that, no longer do you have a single PCB. What you've got is two sided PCB times two connected with a high speed ribbon there in the middle. Now, bear in mind, the last day of news of the week, we talked about Micron's 232 layer NAND. So, although Samsung are clearly going a uh, direction you're utilizing their existing NAND structure by improving upon it. 
A lot of other brands, again, including Seagate, who have a great partnership with Micron, are going to probably take advantage of the 232 layer instead of this. And we're seeing another example of the top tier SSD brands and their closest partners divulging out into different structure there. What I'm really looking forward to is seeing what WD's answer to this is. We've already seen a lot of their DDR5 um, and, um, uh, not DDR5, I'm saying PCI Gen 5 uh, solutions being bubbled to the surface, but nothing you really formally revealed from WD. So I think that's something we're probably going to see very, very soon. And finally, we've got a clutch of new products there. We're going to talk a little bit more about this one first, the Rocket 4 Plus G, before we talk about the other, because this is the one that kind of stood out the most for me. Um, for those who aren't aware, we've talked about the uh, Sabrent series of SSDs in the past, Rocket 4 Plus, that 7,000 megs SSD that was upgraded recently with a 176 layer NAND on board and improvement to the controller with firmware. And this takes it a little bit extra there. This is taking advantage of the new um, O2 Go firmware there. And again, the architecture of this drive is very similar to what we've seen in the Plus 4 uh, Rocket 4 Plus series. But what is it that makes it different? Well, it is the adoption and taking advantage of direct storage. Now, if you are looking at this as a PS5 gamer, you can largely ignore this. Even Xbox gamers who can't really take advantage of this drive can ignore it. But at the same time, if you are a new gener uh, current generation console gamer, you've been sort of taking advantage of this for a while. First unveiled in 2020, uh, direct storage was the means of taking advantage of the high performance IOPS that are made available via NVMe. So for those that aren't aware, we've moved well outside the boundaries of traditional loading when it comes to games. You have a drive, it loads all the assets onto the memory in the GPU, and then the game plays and feeds from those assets. But now game worlds have become so outlandishly huge with lots of stuff on the fly that the idea is that you are constantly loading from a drive at all times. Hence the utilization of IOPS for much smaller areas of loading happening in increased frequency from the NVMe. Now, NVMe has high IOPS. It has high traditional transfer rates thanks to the PCIe bandwidth. However, when you do, as you can see from this diagram, see from the top here, you are pulling from the NVMe, it then goes into the, the cache or the memory, but then it has to be unpack, uh, unpacked and processed by the CPU and then fed into the GPU's own memory and own storage on board there. Now, direct storage allows you to completely remove the CPU from the equation. The data is being accessed and uh, calibrated and utilized from the SSD. Uh, via direct storage and that increased firmware, it is then passed into the memory and then into the GPU for immediate processing there. Completely, hugely decreasing background loading uh, of small and large assets. This is something, again, console gamers have been taking advantage of for a while because the latest generation has been geared around this design. It's how these super fast worlds can be created on that. But PC users have only recently been granted access to this and media that is designed around this architecture with firmware on board that is designed to output and input via direct storage so it can be handed to the memory in the GPU is going to be advantageous and the Rocket 4 Plus is one of an incredibly small contingent of drives that are gearing towards this and this is something we're going to hear about more and more in 2023 as PC gamers are now able to gear their system to take advantage of those high IOPS performance levels. And just a couple of other new products to talk about there. First and foremost, this one kind of slipped me by, and this would have been on Data News of the Week if I'd done one last week, and that is that Synology hard drives are now available in 18 TB. They rolled out 18 TB a little quietly, it has to be said. They, unlike a lot of their other drives, even the 4 TB, they've been slowly bolstering and increasing the drives on their lineup. And the 18 TB taking advantage of the MG09 from uh, Toshiba on their uh, Enterprise Level Drive series, again, brings some great performance numbers there. It's the highest performing drive by transfer rates, uh, or by the reported transfer rates by far, and it still maintains all of the advantages of the other drives out there. I'm still waiting for a pricing on that drive, because though it's listed and on some sites there isn't really reliable pricing at this point but uh, you know you're going to see real, uh, availability on this drive by around about september there another product i want to talk about um last one here is from qnap the q horror series anyone remember that it was 
oh it still is uh, QNAP's router that has Wi-Fi 6 and 10 GB on board they're taking that logic and extending it to a range of new 10 GB and 2.5 GBE solutions that are far more modest and again they've done a whole video on their own YouTube channel and over on uh, NAS compares I'm just fleshing out an article right now detailing a lot of those specifications so although right now it looks a little bare bones I will be fleshing out this article shortly for you. There's lots of information on the hardware and capabilities for this new QHORA range of routers. And although, frankly, I do not like that um, name, the QHORA makes no sense to me, I still like these solutions as some great uh, business-led routers there that don't allow you to just focus on the network, it, uh, on the wireless network connectivity. This really does balance things between the wired and the wireless. But this has been Data News of the Week. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been a bit of a long one this week to make up for last week. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in Edinburgh. Uh, I'll be honest, enjoying myself. Hopefully, fingers crossed, Comedy Festival. I'll try and get the Data News of the Week. It might come a little bit earlier than normal. But otherwise, have a great weekend, and I will see you next time.